Welcome to today's edition of the Rush 24-7 Podcast. Man, I don't know about you folks, but as I look at the news every day and as I study it and as I prep the program, you know what I give thanks for every day is that I am not in the news. What an absolute cesspool the news is. It is a cesspool. And yet, we wade around in it each and every day here at the EIB Network. Great to have you, my friends. We're going to do open line uh, Friday or Wednesday today. Live from the Southern Command in sunny South Florida, it's open line day. Uh, because of the Thanksgiving holiday, we'll not be here on Friday. Who's, who, who did you say is going to... That's right, Ken Matthews of the NSA will be here on, uh, on Friday, uh, guest hosting. So the rules are whatever you want to talk about, have at it. Uh, no restrictions in terms of what you can normally Monday through Friday, Monday through Thursday. Callers have to talk about things I care about or am interested in. But uh, that's not going to be the case today. It can be anything. Have a story at 800-282-2882, the email address, lrushbo at eibnet.us. A tradition on this program, the real story of Thanksgiving. We will share it with you yet again. Uh, this has been a tradition since my first book, See, I Told, or the, the Way Things Ought to Be, rather. And it's, uh, it, it's especially relevant now since the original Thanksgiving is so misunderstood and as much of education is, uh, mistaught. And actually, uh, young people, young people, young people lied about, lied to about, uh, much of the founding of our country and so. Our tradition is to set it straight each and every day here. We also have the um, the spectacle, the New York Times. You know, the New York Times is a Bible to the American left. It's a Bible to the journalism community. It's it's a Bible to young millennial journalists. And the New York Times have, has published two stories recently which... You know, I know who the Times is. I know, I know what they do. I, I, I know they're radical leftists. I know they're not any longer mainstream leftists, but there are two stories here, two columns, two op-eds, and one of them, I, I really, I really don't know how this one passed muster. It is a column from an educated individual claiming that Charles Manson is the intellectual energy and creator behind the modern conservative movement. Charles Manson was the godfather of Ronald Reagan. Charles Manson was the inspiration for modern-day conservatism. You know why? Because what Manson was really doing back in 1969 when he started killing rich white people was to inspire. He wanted to create a race war. Because Charles Manson didn't like African Americans. He was a racist, they say. And that is the linkage. And the New York Times publishes an op-ed from a fool making this point. Now, the problem is that the New York Times readership is a bunch of sponges. And they're going to soak this up, and they're going to be running around thinking that they're now enlightened and they've learned something. And then there was another piece that ran this week. Claiming this is not a new thought. Now this I, I, this one does not surprise me. They would run, but we we're going to dissect both of these. Capitalism is the threat to the world, and must be replaced. Capitalism is the reason everything in the world that's wrong is wrong. Everything bad is bad because of capitalism, and the column makes the point that capitalism is exclusively why we are losing the planet to climate change and the only solution to saving the planet is to eliminate capitalism and immediately swerve to democrat socialism democratic socialism so i'm going to be taking yet another opportunity today to explain why socialism always ends up as dictatorship why socialism always ends up being communism. Why socialism ends up with people living in tyranny despite 
the dreams and the desires of the democratic socialists to create a utopia. There's a very simple reason why socialism ends up as a tyranny. There's a reason why socialism ends up having to build walls around countries to keep people in. It's a very simple explanation. I'll just give you a hint. With socialism, the only opportunity to acquire any kind of power and any kind of wealth is in the government. Because under democratic socialism, everybody else is quote-unquote equal. And in the case of socialism, it's equally miserable. Nothing is allowed, no differences, no wealth, no prosperity is allowed in the general population under socialism. Somehow that equals utopia. But human nature is human nature. Human beings want wealth. They want better lifestyles. And human natures, uh, human nature is a um, uh, undeniable characteristic of, or has an undeniable characteristic of people pursuing power. And under socialism, the only place anybody can go to acquire wealth and power is the government. And once you get there and you start utilizing the government to enrich yourself and to empower yourself, well, that's when you start doing mean and bad things to everybody else in the general population. And that is why there is no socialist utopia. It is why there never has been. It's why there never will be. I don't care what the dreams and desires are. But yet here's the New York Times with yet another op-ed in a in a, in a period of time, I don't know how many op-eds like this they have run. The problem in the world is capitalism. The problem with climate change is capitalism. The problem with illegal immigration is, cli- is capital. Whatever the problem, capitalism is the root of all evil and must be eradicated. But this piece, crediting Charles Manson, for being the intellectual inspiration and motivation for modern-day conservatism. How does that pass the editorial board, the op-ed page at the New York Times? It's because somebody wants that story to run. And the reason they would want that story to run is because they are obsessed and consumed by sheer, utter hatred. The American left today and the Democrat Party is the largest hate group in America. And if you look out over the news today, as I just did, and you see nothing but a cesspool and you give thanks that you're not in it, the rage and the anger, the discontent, the absence of happiness, all are characteristics of modern-day liberals. Here's a piece from GQ, Gentleman's Quarterly. They just put Colin Kaepernick on their cover as Citizen of the Year. A guy who's never voted has become Citizen of the Year at GQ, a supposed men's fashion magazine. In fact, the way to lead into this is to share with you a tweet from Chuck Hugh Schumer. We were talking about this earlier this week. In years past... On Thanksgiving, Obama and the Democrats have always urged you to talk politics at Thanksgiving dinner. Obama ran ads. Remember the Pajama Boy series of ads was actually an Obama administration production designed to get you to start selling Obamacare over the Thanksgiving holiday to your friends and family gathered for Thanksgiving dinner. Obama urged this. This year, a bunch of leftists have come forth and said, you know what, let's not talk politics this year because they're losing, folks. They think they're in trouble. There's not a whole lot going on politically they want you to talk about. They've got some things. They think they're going to run the floor with, uh, run the table with Roy Moore and all this. But there's a, there's a huge level of discontent on the left. But it's not universal. There's a tweet here from Chuck Schumer. Bring this chart to Thanksgiving dinner. It'll come in handy when that family member who always talks politics tells you the Republican tax bill helps the middle class. And he's got a chart here from the Joint Committee on Taxation, which is a bunch of caca, showing that the Republican tax bill, House and Senate version, only cut taxes 
for the wealthiest Americans. It's nowhere near the case. Wealthy, the wealthiest Americans are not going to get a tax cut. Well, they're not going to get a rate reduction. In fact, they're going to pay a special rate of 46% in order to make sure they don't get a tax rate reduction. But anyway, how the leftists ruin Thanksgiving, how they seek to ruin Thanksgiving. So here's Chuck Schumer printing out a chart in a tweet. You're supposed to print it out, take it with you to Thanksgiving dinner, and provoke an argument among any Republicans at your Thanksgiving dinner, and then throw this chart in their face to show them how wrong they are and how the Republican tax reform bill is only going to benefit the rich. And then the GQ story, the headline, it is your civic duty to ruin Thanksgiving by bringing up Trump. This turkey day, consider making life hell for a few of your relatives. It's late November 2017, and you know what that means. Every man you've ever seen on TV for any reason has just been unmasked as a woman-hating ghoul. Also, it's time to ruin your Trump-supported family's Thanksgiving for America. Thanksgiving's a celebration of community and gratitude, where we reconvene in our nostalgia-drenched hometowns and perform time-honored traditions such as almost sleeping with your high school crush and going around the table to say what you're most thankful for and where you were on 9-11. It goes on and on to talk about what happens at Thanksgiving dinner and then offers a few suggestions for how to ruin Thanksgiving. One, don't show up. For some parents, your absence will speak louder than any sodden arguments over the density of pumpkin pie. Anyway, I can go through the details, but the point is made. How to, you have, in fact, you have a civic duty to ruin Thanksgiving by bringing up Donald Trump and whatever else. Let me take a brief time out. We'll come back. And, of course, the left is just in a tizzy over the fact that Donald Trump has essentially endorsed Roy Moore in Alabama. So a lot going on today as we get you into the official Thanksgiving holiday weekend here on the EIB Network. Hang in and don't go away, folks. We'll be right back. I'm not going to bother showing you the chart from Chuck Schumer on the Ditto Cam. I'm not going to take the time and go to the trouble. I just want you to understand that it is a total lie. The way Schumer and the Democrats try to make their point with a chart that tax cuts are only going to benefit the rich, that there are no tax cuts for the middle class. The point of it is that the tax cuts are going to sunset in 10 years. The Republicans did that in order to make the budget budget neutral. It's a time-honored gimmick, and it's because of the way these things are scored by the various budget offices and so forth. They score these things in a static fashion. And so some of the tax cuts will sunset in 10 years. And because of that, Schumer's taking it. See, these are, these are just nothing, nothing here for the middle class. It's a convoluted argument. The thing that you just have to realize is that no matter what is in a tax cut offered by the Republicans, the Democrats are going to demagogue it and say it's nothing but a tax cut for the rich and not for anybody else. But the chart that he has published here, just trust me on this, is a, is a total lie. And the thing about socialism and capitalism, very easy to remember this, folks. We've observed this on many previous occasions. In capitalism, rich people become powerful. In capitalism, middle class people can become rich. In capitalism, middle class people who become rich can then become powerful. In socialism, the powerful become rich. In socialism, the great middle class has no chance to become powerful or rich by design. And that leaves only one place for people to go. To acquire power and to acquire money, and that is the government, and us, and, and more importantly, running it, having control over it. And human nature being what it is, it is why socialism always ends up being a tyranny. Now the New York Times piece on 
capitalism as the threat to the world, and it must be replaced. This is by somebody named Benjamin Fong. He's a professor at Arizona State University. He says capitalism is the problem. Environmentalism is the movement that can supersede it, proving a point that I've always made, that modern-day environmentalism is simply the new home of communism. When the state-sponsored communism of the Soviet Union imploded, there was a bunch of homelessness, if you will, among worldwide communists who loved and adored the Soviet Union. And environmentalism is right out of the pages of socialism and communism. And so environmentalism became the new home. It became the place for uh, abandoned communists to go in order to have some relevance. And this proves it. Mr. Fong here unwittingly proves my point. Capitalism is the problem. Environmentalism is the movement that can supersede it. Well, the movement that's opposed to capitalism is communism, so there's his admission. Here's some of what he says in this piece. The real culprit of the climate crisis is not any particular form of consumption or production or regulation. Instead, it's the very way in which we globally produce, which is for profit rather than sustainability. So it's the old argument. This guy's got something up his crawl. He's very upset that everybody out there producing and creating and moving and distributing is doing it for profit. And that makes it evil. And that makes it bad. And that makes it horrible. That makes it unequal. That makes it unfair. Instead, All of these producers and distributors and manufacturers should be doing it for one reason only, sustainability. Did I not tell you sustainability is the key word today in attracting millennials and other unsuspecting young people? Sustainable energy, sustainable income, sustainable health care, sustainable what? So this guy is saying that the real culprit of the climate crisis is the pursuit of profit rather than the pursuit of sustainability. So everybody involved ought to just produce no more than what anybody needs, and you should pay no more than what it costs, and the producer should make no more than what it costs. And so there would essentially be no cost to anything. Everything's free. If you pay the producer exactly what it cost him to produce it, and you throw in the price of what it takes to distribute it, and if there's no profit, why then it's wonderful, and it's never-ending. It's totally sustainable, because there will not be any overproduction. There will not be any mining of minerals that will destroy the earth. There will not be any excesses of anything, because we'll only need what we need, and we'll only produce what we need, and we'll only use what we need. If nobody makes any money, then it's a panacea. Of course, if nobody makes any money, then what's the motivation for this? What is the impetus? Why would anybody do it? And where does the original seed cost come from? I mean, you're going to produce product X. Somebody's going to have to make the investment in what's necessary to produce it or manufacture it. If you don't get paid until somebody buys it, And what guarantee is that somebody's going to buy it? How do you know how much to produce? And then how much do you know to buy so that everything zeroes out? It's absurd. But if you take profit out of it, you take motive. You take purpose. You take inspiration. You take out. You'll have no production to speak of. You'll have no distribution. Why do it? People are going to be working under the table in the black market trying to do things to make money. Human nature. So this clown, this Fong guy says, so long as this order is in place, the pursuit of profit instead of sustainability, the crisis will continue. And it will worsen. This is a hard fact to confront, he says, but averting our eyes from a seemingly intractable problem does not make it any less a problem. It should be stated plainly, it's capitalism that is at fault in destroying the planet. There's more, but I don't 
please don't ever forget this. Whenever you hear of any new proposal from the environmentalist wackos, United Nations, understand what it is. It is an attack on capitalism, and that means it is an attack on the United States. And that means it's an attack on all of us. It's a man, a legend, a way of life. Christmas bonuses to jump 66% to $1,797. Uh, $1, People who will work... Sorry, folks, I've got all kinds of technical problems here. People who work will have, an, on average, an extra $716 to spend for Christmas. This is the latest sign of a booming economy. Paul Bedard has it, the Washington Examiner. <clears throat> Excuse me. Human resources officers from some 500 companies are anticipating a massive 66% increase in cash Christmas bonuses. So what's happened here is that some survey firms have called various businesses. You're planning on bonusing your employees. They're, yeah, yeah, how much? And they give them the figure, and so they figure is averaged, and that's where the $1,797 figure comes from. Not saying that you are automatically going to get a bonus. This is an average based on companies that have been talked to, and it's, uh, let's see, how many? 500. <clears throat> 500 corporations anticipating this increase. 39% uh, of companies plan to give employees other perks throughout the year instead of a bonus. 38% will give charity. When is the last time you saw a story like this? When is the last time we saw a story on the economy booming, unemployment coming down, Wages increasing and bonuses. Do you remember any kind of stories like this during, say, the seven or eight years of Obama? I frankly don't. There weren't any stories. During the seven or eight years of Obama, well, it was eight, during the eight years of Obama, we were told that there's a new normal. That we had seen our salad days, you know, that we've, we've peaked. And that now the, the new objective was to Manage the new America, a more realistic America, an America uh, not as prosperous and therefore not as injurious to other nations in the world. We were told to manage the decline, or we were told the decline was being managed, and that what was the purpose of Obama and his administration. And you could chalk this up to all the other economic news now showing on the plus side, and there's a reason for it. It's Donald Trump and the stock market going nuts. The reason for it is Donald Trump. Donald Trump's an optimist. And if anybody would have a right not to be an optimist, it's Trump. If anybody had a right to be depressed and ticked off and angry and seething and plotting revenge each and every day, it would be Trump. He has been relentlessly assaulted, attacked, you name it, for over two years, two and a half years, and consistently every day with lies and distortions. I mean, the entire apparatus of the Washington establishment has been mobilized for two years. And yet, despite that, Trump remains optimistic and smiling, and he continues to fight back against these people to the point now where wages, increases, Christmas bonuses, economic growth, 3% or more, is routinely talked about. So in that context, I guess it doesn't surprise me the New York Times would be devoted here to running pieces, trying to destroy the concept of capitalism. I want to read this paragraph to you again and ask you a question. The real culprit of the climate crisis, and especially for you millennials out there, the day before Thanksgiving is always on this program, has always sort of evolved into a day of lessons, historical remembrances, teaching, if you will. Now, I realize that there are many people, it's the fastest growing audience in American talk radio, and it's the largest, and there are people tuning in new every day, and we're getting from all demographics, all walks of life. By the way, this is the one program in America. If you are outside the 1849 demographic, we love you. 
Do you realize that in most of media, once you're past the 1849 debt, once you hit 50 or older, nobody cares about you. Advertisers don't care about you. Nobody cares about you because there's nothing they can sell you. You've already had your mind made up on per pretty much everything you buy. Everybody associates youth with opportunity and potential and so forth. And the 18 to 49 demographic, I mean, no, after, you, after you surpass that, no matter where you are, nobody cares about you. But not true here. We think there are teachable moments for everybody. So let me read this graph again. The real culprit of the climate crisis is not any particular form of consumption. It's not the crisis of problem, any particular form of production or regulation, rather the way in which we globally produce, which is for profit rather than for sustainability. Now, how many of you think it's possible to produce only what we need that doesn't cost anybody anything and that the producers don't make any money? How many of you think that's possible? How many of you think that's desirable? I think young people think that, that that sounds really cool. That's the essence of sustainability. It's really cool. Okay, now answer me this. What are you going to live on? Let's say you produce widgets, and you have to produce two million a year because that's how many are needed. So you produce the widgets, and then you sell them for exactly what it costs you to make them. Which is fair, right? You're not earning any, you're not earning any profit. You're, 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 you're being really nice. You're being fair and, and you're, and you're really caring. How are you going to hire employees? What are you going to pay them with? And where do you get the money required to manufacture your widgets? If everything zeroes out, let me ask you this. You go to the butcher. The butcher is an example here because Adam Smith used it in his book. When you go to the butcher and you've got an array of choices in front of you, and you wow, this is really cool. This is a great butcher. You think a butcher has put that array of things there for you? No. The butcher's in business for himself. The butcher is trying to sell you things that he thinks you want and things that you need, and he's trying to sell the best quality he can for a competitive price, but he's doing this for himself. This is called... Selfishness by people that don't understand it. Self-interest by those who do. The butcher is not trying to make sure you eat every day. The butcher is not trying to make sure you have healthy food in front of you. The butcher is trying to support himself. The great thing about it is that you benefit, too, in the process. Because if the butcher weren't doing that, what would you have to do? You'd have to head out to the wilderness and find a steer, and you'd have to kill it, and you'd have to dress it and prepare it, and you'd have to do everything the butcher does for you. The butcher saves you a lot of time. The butcher saves you a lot of trouble, and you are willing to pay for that. And the butcher makes a little profit so that he can buy some of his own stuff for his own family. And this is bare essence is the theory. But if there's no profit anywhere, if nobody makes any money as a result of what they do, let's say you're an employee and your business makes widgets and your business sells two million widgets, what do you get paid and on what basis? Do you get paid only enough to where the employer doesn't have to lose money paying you to make the widgets? When everything zeroes out, you don't have sustainability. You have nothing. Because there's no reason for anybody to do anything. Yes, there is, Mr. Limbaugh, for the good of the community. Oh, really? I mean, everybody in a community is going to do what they're doing now. And they're going to sell what they sell now. They're going to make what they make now. They're going to produce what they produce now for no money. You're going to buy it for no more than what it costs. And everybody's going to be just hunky-dory happy at the end of every day when all of this commerce is gone. That's right. That's You've got it, Mr. Limbaugh. That's exactly right. Well, then what do you buy your house with? Or your apartment or your car? What, 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 what do you buy that with? If there isn't profit, if there isn't a pool of money for people to chase, there's not going to be a reason that anything gets produced. 
What they want you to believe about capitalism, that everybody is in it, is a selfish rip-off artist. And all they're doing is overcharging you and selling you a bunch of inferior garbage. They're tricking you. They're lying to you. And they're getting rich off of you. And they've got piles of money in the back room that you never see because they don't share it with anybody. They're evil. And the bigger the business, the worse it is. And if you doubt me, just listen to the Democrat Party and its enemies list of corporations. And it's practically every one. It's a nice-sounding thing, sustainability. Just produce things for what they cost and sell them for exactly what they cost, and it's just a beautiful thing. And then everything would be more affordable, but it wouldn't. There would be scarcity like you can't imagine. There would be people killing people to get things to eat. There would be people doing horrible things to one another in order to get food, shelter, you name it. No, Mr. Limbo, the government would provide all that. With what? Where's the government get its money? Well, the government has all money. No, the government doesn't. The government doesn't have a dime until it takes it from you. The government might sell weapons to Saudi Arabia for a profit. Up, up, can't do it for a profit. We have to sell weapons to Saudi Arabia for no more than what they cost us to make. Forgot that. There can't be any profit because if there's profit, apparently there isn't any sustainability. Horrible. Next paragraph from this clown, Benjamin Fogg. The hope that we can empower intelligent people to positions where they can design the perfect set of regulations or that we can rely on scientists to take the carbon out of the atmosphere and engineer sources of renewable energy serves to cover over the simple fact that the work of saving the planet is political, not technical. We have a much better chance of making it past the 22nd century if environmental regulations are designed by a team of people with no formal education in a Democrat socialist society than we do if they are made by a team of the most esteemed scientific luminaries in a capitalistic society. The intelligence of the brightest people around is no match for the rampant stupidity of capitalism. It's kind of a convoluted paragraph. But what the guy is saying is that there is no technical solution to climate change. It's political, and that means socialist, and that means progressive and liberal. We have to keep the capitalists, the technical people, out of it because all they're going to care about is making a profit. This is so, so stupid. The United States is one of the least polluted places on the earth, and it is precisely the profit motive that has made that possible. Anyway, I'm a little long. I have to take a quick time out, but you, you get the drift. So the left is in panic city here. We had eight years of Obama, and there was, the, 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 see, the eight years of Obama was supposed to produce a utopia, at least a panacea. We're supposed to be on the road here to people being happier and more fulfilled, and there was going to be more equality, no racism, there wasn't going to be any sexism, no sexual harassment, no rape, no bigotry, and it all exploded, and there was worse incidents of that stuff during those eight years. And we're only learning about it now. We didn't learn about it during the Obama years. We're learning about all these excesses now. There wasn't any economic growth, there wasn't any prosperity, there wasn't any advancing prosperity, the left knows in their hearts. They may not have the guts to admit it, but they know what they believe in doesn't work. So they get angry. They lash out. They've been lashing out here, well, all of our lives, but intensely for the last two and a half years. Okay, to the phones we go. This is uh, this is Lori. Yep, Lori Davenport. Davenport, Florida. Where's Davenport, Florida, Lori? Lori, are you there? Testing one, two. It's like a dead, dead phone line. Uh, where we, where do you want to go next? That would be Frank and Phoenix. Frank, you're next. We'll give your phone line a shot. How are you doing, sir? Hi, Rush. Uh, very good. Um, long time fan. Thank you. I appreciate your call, sir. Thank you. 
I just uh, happened to run across an article about John Lasker and Pixar yep. and, uh, and Disney. I guess he's head of uh, animation at Disney now, too. And, uh, and the article uh, says he's stepping away from his job, I guess, leave of absence amid missteps. And I, I was reading the article, and it, I, I thought it was something to do with, uh, you know, financial and, uh, you know, maybe making uh, some bad decisions financially with the company. And then you dig down deep, and it's really all about sexual harassment. Well, that's what the missteps, that's what he meant the missteps to define. Yeah. Me, uh, so you, you, your point is the media is really not, uh, divulging what uh, Lasseter actually did. They're trying to make people think there were some financial improprieties. And... That's what I read when I heard right. that. Right. Uh, so you go to six months of financial rehab as opposed to sex rehab and then come back. John Lasseter is an artist. John Lasseter, uh, founder of Pixar. Steve Jobs bought Pixar. Apple, Steve Jobs bought Pixar and then sold it to Disney. And Lassiter was the reason Jobs bought it. Lassiter, there's, he's hands down one of the most innovative and creative uh, animators going. His reputation is through the roof. He's, 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 uh, but he's, he, I guess he has some executive experience by being the founder and so forth. But this, this story is, as you say, 100% sexual harassment. And his uh, missteps, were the abuse and mistreatment of women. And he's going to get six months to straighten it out. He's going to take a leave of absence for six months. There would not be, I don't, I don't know if it's really true now, but back in the day, it would have been accurate to say there wouldn't be a Pixar without him. I mean, he is to animation what George Lucas was to the genre of, uh, of movies. And you've never heard the name, right? Until this happened, you never heard the name John Lasseter. Well, he is to animation and the modern era of animation. What George? Uh, I mean, what I just said his name. What the, George Lucas is to the uh, sci-fi genre that is Star Wars and so forth. Huge, and so that's why they're going to give him six months instead of thirty days at the sex rehab clinic. He's got six months. Uh, the thing about this is Disney. Disney has. Ah, look at this. Damn it! Now I got it right in the middle of a slam dunk point, and here I gotta take a break. I'm sorry. It is the fastest three hours in media. It's Rush Limbaugh. This is the day before Thanksgiving, which means the official story of Thanksgiving is written by me. One of my early books will be read before the program ends. I'm also thinking of reading George Washington's first Thanksgiving proclamation. And it might be a timely thing to do as well. Still deciding on that. Back here in just a second. Hi, folks, and welcome back. Great to have you here. It's Rush Limbaugh and the Excellence in Broadcasting Network. And the fastest three hours in media. On the day before Thanksgiving, you're over the river and through the woods. However you're getting where you're going, we are here to help you get there. Live from the Southern Command in sunny South Florida, it's Open Line Friday! 800-282-2882 and the email address lrushbow at eibnet.us. New York Times op-ed, Charles Manson was a far right-wing ideologue. The New York Times published an op-ed yesterday suggesting that Charles Manson was the harbinger for alt-right and white supremacists. Nansen's mission to convince a slew of hippies to go on a murdering spree in 1969 to kickstart a race war paved the way for today's right wing. This is piece is written by somebody named Baynard Woods. B-A-Y-N-A-R-D. Baynard Woods. Now, this clown lives in Baltimore. He's the senior editor of something there called the City Paper. And he looks like a pajama boy in a fedora. There's a picture of him here. He has a Ph.D. in ancient philosophy. He writes librettos for rhymes with opera. And he preaches with the rock and roll band, the Barnyard Sharks. 
He's the author of some wacko books and so forth. But he's basically just uh, an academic in Baltimore, and he claims that it is Manson, because what Manson's original purpose was was to kick off a race war. Manson supposedly didn't like blacks, so he thought that he could kick off a race war by murdering rich white people in the Hollywood area and somehow making it look like blacks did it and kick off a race war. And Manson is credited by this guy for ideologically uh, energizing the John Birch Society. He believes that uh, Manson was not so much the end of the hippie generation as much as he was the start of modern right-wing conservatism. And, and, and this gets published in the New York Times. Now, I know it's an op-ed, but somebody on the op-ed page, the editor there, has to look at this and pass muster on it. Charles Manson has served a life sentence. He would have been put to death, except the state of California got rid of the death penalty right around the time he was being sentenced. He was a lunatic, certifiably insane. Yet the left was fascinated with this guy. If anybody was fascinated with Manson, it was the left. The left are the one that made movies about the guy. The left are the ones that wrote books about the guy. Helter Skelter, Vincent Bugliosi. These guys are famous left-wing radicals or Democrats, mainstream Democrats. They're fascinated with this guy. Why would he do it? What made him tick? What was it about Manson? It was almost like a romantic notion they had with this guy. TV journalists of the era reveled in the fact that they once interviewed Manson. Even the police department, the LAPD back then, had elements of the department that were almost groupy-like toward Manson before all of the violence began. Before the violence began, he was just a well-known ragtag sponge. The guy sponged off everybody. He had a Svengali effect particularly on young women. Do you remember the name Squeaky Fromm? What did Squeaky Fromm do? Where? Where? Was it San Francisco? Lynette Squeaky Fromm was one of Charles Manson's acolytes, lived in the commune. They were just a bunch of filthy human debris, folks, and yet the left is fascinated by this guy. They've written books about him. They've done movies about him. To us, he's just full-fledged human debris and not worthy of another moment's notice. The left has kept this guy alive. Every parole hearing, the drive-bys would get together and wonder if there's any way Manson could somehow be released. It was a morbid fascination with this guy. And he'd come along now in the New York Times and claim that this guy is the reason I think what I think. And a you think what you think? And this guy, Charles Manson, was the harbinger of modern-day conservatism. Why? Because this lunatic, Baynard, whatever his name is, thinks that modern-day conservatism is nothing more than racism. That modern-day conservatives are the modern-day equivalent of the Ku Klux Klan, forgetting that the Klan was the military wing of the Democrat Party. Folks, we're playing for keeps here is the point. The New York Times is a Bible. There are lots of young people reading this, seeing this. It's going to be amplified. Lots of people reading this garbage, and they're going to believe it. They're young. They're impressionable. They're not yet old enough to have been sufficiently educated. And by the way, have you seen the surveys of millennials that say well over 50% of them think socialism is wonderful? and preferable precisely because to them it's been pitched as sustainable. And let me give you a manifestation of this. Fox News, the headline, Girl Scouts tells parents not to force daughters to hug relatives over the holidays. Now you're probably saying, wait, 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 wait what? That, that headline didn't make any sense. I know, but I read it verbatim. The Girl Scouts of the USA, maybe they're just miffed that the Boy Scouts has decided to admit girls. The Girl Scouts of America has issued an odd warning to parents for the upcoming holidays, cautioning parents not to force their daughters 
to give relatives hugs or kisses and to offer instead the alternative of less personal kinds of touching. Now, while a directive to withhold affection from one's family may sound like an overreach, the Girl Scouts explained in a public service announcement on their official website that, quote, telling your child that she owes someone a hug, either just because she hasn't seen this person in a while or because they gave her a gift, can set the stage for your little girl questioning whether she owes another person any type of physical affection when they've bought her dinner or done something else seemingly nice for her later in life. Do you follow this now? The Girl Scouts of America is urging family members not to have their little girls hug other family members over the holidays because this can eventually lead to sexual harassment and rape is what they're getting at. If you condition your daughter to hug Uncle Fred after Uncle Fred gives her a Barbie doll, then you are conditioning your daughter to go out and hug Mr. X, who might give her a gift. And Mr. X might then expect to be hugged. And Mr. X might just give the gift or buy your daughter dinner in hopes of having her hug him or more. And so to guard against creating this reaction in your daughter, tell your daughter to hug nobody. Hugging a family member as gratitude or greeting can lead to unwanted sexual advances later in life. Now, notwithstanding that some families have reprobates in them, the point here is, well, come on, I mean, everybody... Everybody knows that. What they're trying to do now is convince you that your family life and the way you are raising your daughter can make her susceptible to future acts of sexism, sexual harassment, or even rape. And the way to stop this dead in its tracks is to make sure your little girl hugs nobody over the holidays. Girl Scouts of America. It's not the New York Times saying it. It's not some left-wing politician. This is the Girl Scouts of America. We are now supposed to believe young girls are in danger of being molested by their relatives right in front of their parents. Or we are now being led to believe that young girls being hugged by their relatives sets the stage for young girls unknowingly sending a signal that somebody else could hug them. The Girl Scouts of America, which aims to build courage, confidence, and character in young girls, further elaborated on how parents can help daughters navigate social situations this holiday season, recommending alternatives to kissing and hugging that include a high five or a thank you with a smile. Or a fist bump. So instead of hugging, high five, thank you with a smile, or fist bump. But no hugging. The nation, the far, far fringe left wacko news publication, suggests, do you know the Washington Redskins are hosting one of the Thanksgiving football games in the NFL? The nation believes that the Redskins hosting a Thanksgiving Day game is the owners of the NFL showing their true racist anti-Indian feelings. (laughs) But these people, they're incapable of being happiness. They have to find some sort of ism in everything, even if it's harmless and good. What fans ought to be most concerned about is the Redskins aren't going anywhere. The game isn't going to mean anything. Who are the Redskins even playing? And who is the? Uh, it's the Thursday night game. NBC has it, and I knew it's on top of my head. But the NFL purposely scheduled the Redskins. On Thanksgiving night. Because we all know. We all 
Oh, that's right. The Giants. I mean, what a dud. What a, that's if anybody ought to be upset. It's a dud game in primetime on Thanksgiving. Of course, when the schedule makers put it together, they didn't know that the Giants were going to be pathetic and the Redskins were not going to be that much better. But for crying out loud. So this sends a signal, see, this sends a signal. The NFL is exemplifying how we mistreated the Indians at Thanksgiving because that's what they think Thanksgiving was. The Indians saved us. Without the Indians, we wouldn't be here. And what we turn around and do, we screwed them out of Manhattan, and we didn't feed them, and we, we put them on reservations, and we, we turned them into alcoholics. And so now here comes the NFL hammering that even further by making the Redskins play on Thanksgiving night. This is your normal thought process <laughs> on display by your average, ordinary, run-of-the-mill leftist publication. Okay, I'm going to take a break. I'm going to come back, and I want to start getting into phone calls with uh, with all of you, because I think we've even got somebody who wants to respond to this Girl Scout business, right? Or we did. Yeah, wanted to bring it. Oh, did I steal the thunder? Oh, gee, I didn't mean to do that. Well, we'll be right back. Oh, we got Lori in Davenport, Florida back. I asked, where's, where's Davenport, Florida, Lori? Hi, Ross. It's uh, just south of Disney. Oh, okay, cool. Well, welcome. I'm glad that you made it back. Thank you. Rush, this Thanksgiving, I am so thankful for you. You've been an important part of our family. We pray uh, for you, your staff, and your families. We love you dearly. Well, I thank you. I, you don't know how much that means. I truly appreciate it. Thank you. You are a member of our family. Um, Rush, I'm 55, and I never thought I would see the day. I know we're sometimes we want to grab on to the little scandals on the other side and pray that this is the moment where they finally get what's coming to them. But I have never seen these top-tier people, the Democrats, the media people, Hollywood, the Disney guy, the hypocrisy of all this. They're frauds, and their own have ha- are having to report on it, and I'm watching them eat their own. And doesn't it prove President Trump correct? They're all fake. They're all frauds. These go-to people that have been lecturing me my whole life, I used to listen listen to them. I thought they were the smartest people. How do they survive it? I I don't understand it. And let me say, too, I used to listen to them until I found you, and I have my husband to thank for that. Me, too. (laughs) Thank you, Laurie's husband. (laughs) I was so happy you know it i'll never forget when we heard you for the first time my mouth fell open in fact i nearly delivered our son in the car early i was laughing so hard whoa that could be good or bad i'll take it as a compliment it's a compliment well you know it's an interesting question what is going to happen to these people you know behind the scenes behind the scenes that a that reclamation projects are underway like cbs is going to try to find a way to get charlie rose back and Bloomberg is going to try to find a way to get him back. You no 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 don't see the every, the, the guys on the this other side of glass the glass are shaking their this head. No the way board. they went too far. They're gonna they're gonna try to find ways to bring him back. They're gonna try to they have to for the sake of the movement. They can't let these guys end up being the legacy and the and the faces of liberal media and uh, and all. But look, it's still it's a fascinating question. I myself have been asking where does this bottom out. And how do they deal with it? And I'm not yet certain that I know. But look, hang on, Lori. One more thing on this. Okay, back to Lori in Davenport, Florida, which is near Disney. So what do you think is going to happen? What do you, what do you think is going to happen to these guys? The media people you mentioned, uh, I, I guarantee you, you think it's odd when I say that they're going to bring Charlie Rose back or try to. They're trying to hold on to Al Franken. They're doing everything they can to hold on to Al Franken. You They're doing everything they can to hold on to John Conyers. They're doing everything they can. So what do you think you know voters what? are going to do in, re- in response to this? Well, these, these same people are also up in age. It also shows how irrelevant and out of touch they are. They don't, I don't see that they have a bench. I, I just I can't imagine. For the first time in my life, I feel like they're, they are in deep panic. With the Clintons, which what's coming out of, with this uranium scandal, that's another thing. How does Mueller survive this? Because he's attached to this as well. He's got to know that the FBI informant's coming out. How do that's? I think it, it feels like it's all imploding at once. 
I don't think they ever see things this way. I, I don't. I don't think this. I've noticed this my entire career. You have just described what would be a natural human reaction if it were you and me that were caught up in these scandals. But that's not how these people think. These, they, 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 in their minds, Laurie, they have the power to massage this or change this to look like anything else, something else, anything other than something that indicts them or uh, encompasses them. I, I don't think they worry about this at all. I think I think their their strategizing is all calculation. Like I said yesterday, they're not worried that things are imploding on the Clintons. If anything, they're happy about it. They want the Clintons gone. Precisely as you mentioned, the lack of a bench. Uh, the, the Clintons' scandals can't be massaged any longer, but the Clintons have served their purpose. Uh, I'm sure that Robert Mueller is, doesn't give a second of a thought at any time to any trouble he's in. In his mind, he's the one with the power to destroy people. And at some point, he's going to try. At some point, he's going to lower the boom. At some point, Mueller is going to try to take Trump out. Robert Mueller's not running around like, oh, my God, I'm indicted. I'm, 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 I, might be, I might be part of this uranium one thing. In their minds, they've got the power to keep everybody's focus and attention away from that. They own the court system. They don't, they don't feel vulnerable. It's not part of who they are. They, they don't they don't approach these things this way. In their minds, they never are out of control. In their minds, they are never out of power. And one of the reasons is they've always got the media. The media can always bend and shape anything to a favorable position or outcome for people on the left. Now look at let's get Laurie, thanks for the call. I really appreciate it, and I'm I'm flattered to no end of your, your, your kind comments at the beginning of your call. But let's get down and dirty on no, wrong phrase, not down and dirty. What I mean is let's let's really examine some of these allegations and complaints of the behavior of some of these liberal men, both in media and in politics and in entertainment. The way they have treated these women. Now, I have always made the point on this program in my anti-feminist screeds and so forth that, in my view, in a civilized society, in my view, it's always been women who hold all the cards, the women who actually have the power. I don't mean in the power to destroy or the power to control. The po- I'm talking about a uh, literally in, in terms of control of circumstances. Women and the pursuit of women is what makes the world go round, and it always has that in the pursuit of money. This is not sexist. This is not anything negative. And what I mean by in a civilized society where a woman says no, you obey. A woman says no, okay. You don't force yourself. You don't deny. Woman says no. You ask her to marry her. She says no. You don't go ahead and schedule a wedding and drag her there by the hair and make the priest do it. She says no. It's no. First date, kiss, and any more, whatever she says goes in a civilized society. These guys are not civilized. These guys are not what I'm talking about. These guys force themselves on women who did not have any power precisely because these were not romantic circumstances. These were, these were office, workspace, business scenarios. And these guys telling us all these years that they're the sensitive ones and that they're the ones with compassion and tolerance and all that other left-wing gooey stuff, totally wrong. These are nothing but mean, power-mad, rude, extreme people who are not nice, have no manners, it just it cuts down to nothing more complicated than that. And so these guys that are all 
caught up in all of this. They engage in a kind of behavior that is unacceptable in civilized circumstances. They take advantage of the power they have, and they use it, and they wield it, and they do it to inflict pain. They do it to inflict emotional and psychological suffering. And who are these guys? Well, before all this happened, these are the people we think are cool. These are the people we're told are hip. These are the people we're told that understand women and women's issues, and they respect women, and they're good feminists and all this, and it, nothing could be further from the truth. And this is exposing so much about who these guys really are, who these people really are. Now, I will admit I'm accepting the word of these women because the men I'm talking about have all willingly left their jobs or have been forced out and did not object, did not, they, they've not claimed that it's all lies. They're off at sex rehab or they're still in state of denial uh, to one degree or another. But there's nothing redeeming about these guys. There's nothing about them that would be anything you would want to emulate. Not in a civilized society. And I think a lot of this, if I may delve even deeper, I think part of this is because these guys have struck out with women on their own throughout much of their lives. And this is the only way that they have been able to get attention or affection, and it's not what it is, but in my explanation here, these are guys I think have been rejected time and again. So they've gone into various businesses where they have power and the power attracts women because the women also want to be in these businesses and succeed in them. But I think this is pretty sick stuff. These guys are, well, there's nothing redeeming about them. But all this time, liberal women have protected them. Liberal women, feminists, have done their best. Something has caused the dam to break now. Don't know what it is. There's obviously a simple, easy explanation for this. But now the truth is coming out about all of these people. And before any of this happened, like Laurie said, these were respected people. At some point in your life, you trusted them if they were in the news and reporting the news and telling you what happened. If they were... Actors or producers, you uh, you had respect for their work, but now all that's out the window. And I think we're learning exactly who these people have always been. But make no mistake about it. The Democrat Party is trying to hold on to Al Franken. The Democrat Party is trying to hold on to John Conyers. It's easier to throw a Weinstein overboard. It's easier to throw a Charlie Rose overboard. The CBS is begging the Oprah to come in and replace Charlie Rose until Christmas. They're begging the Oprah to sit in Charlie Rose's chair two, three times a week just until they can figure out who they want to replace Charlie with. Halperin's gone. They didn't take much time. They didn't, on the media side, they didn't take much time. They didn't make much of an effort to save these guys. The word came out and they were gone. But it doesn't mean they're not going to try to rehab them and get them back. It's just like Dan Rather, folks. Dan Rather totally makes up that National Guard story about George W. Bush. Now, CBS didn't rehire him, and neither did ABC or NBC. But he's working, and he's doing news, and he's reporting, and he's a guest on these shows, uh, late-night comedy shows. He's a guest on MSNBC. He is not totally shamed out of the business. The guy broke every rule of journalism. He made it up. He utilized forged documents. He was driven by an agenda to affect the outcome of an election. George W. Bush, he was trying to kick and force George W. Bush out of office, got caught. And, the, and the, the deans of journalism circled the wagons and tried to protect him. They gave him awards, new dinners, new awards they manufactured just to give him. Because what's at stake here is the movement, the cause, liberalism. 
And they cannot allow these guys, the Weinsteins, the Charlie Roses, the Mark Halperins, the, 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 the list is up to 40 guys, and they can't allow these people to become the face or legacy of liberalism. So they're going to have to try to rehab them somehow. They may not get their jobs back, but I'll guarantee you every one of them down the road, we're going to get stories on how they had to really come to grips with the demons they faced. And they went to rehab or they went wherever and they got therapy and they've come to grips and they have now offered deep and personal apologies to every woman they abused, offended, uh, harassed, what have you. Those stories are coming. The rehabilitation stories, the I've seen the light, the... I saw the light. I have been cleansed. Those stories will happen because the left cannot afford for them not to. I take a break. We'll be back. We will continue in mere moments. I'll give you two more examples. Brian Williams didn't just make things up. Brian Williams put himself in the stories that he made up. The way he made things up was to put himself in stories Now, NBC suspended him for a period of time while they supposedly wrung their hands in the corporate executive suite trying to figure out what to do. How do we deal with this? It ought not be anything that takes more than five minutes to figure out. The guy is a journalist, he's an anchor, and he's making it up on the NBC Nightly News, and he is making himself a part of the story. There's no decision, but they took six months with it, and he's back on the air at MSNBC, anchoring a newscast. Now, don't tell me they don't try to save these people. The New York Times, Glenn Thrush, formerly of the Politico, we had news of him. He's the latest, or one of the latest men to be accused of sexual harassment by women. The New York Times is torn about whether to suspend him and fire him. Vanity Fair. The Times is torn about whether Glenn Thrush should lose his job. They're not torn about whether Roy Moore ought to be drummed out of a campaign. They are not torn about anything when it involves what they consider to be moral depravity on the part of right-wingers. But when it comes to their people, it's a gray area, you know. On the one hand, women are to be believed. We have to believe the women. Well, I don't know. The women in the Glenn Thrush case were a little drunk in the bar, and so was Glenn Thrush. Wait a minute. What happened to women are to be believed? Well, it's a gray area. What about Juanita Broderick? Juanita Broderick, forcible rape, Bill Clinton. You believe her? Well, I don't know. See? Do not ever doubt me telling you who these people are and how they operate. Uh, back to the phones, Ernesto in Seattle. Welcome, sir. Glad you waited. Great to have you. The EIB Network. Hi. Happy Thanksgiving, Megadiros, Rush. Thank you. Same to you. Hey, I am happy that you touched on the Girl Scouts of America advice to the parents. Isn't that amazing? Uh, yeah, I feel it's totally stupid and out of focus. The way I see it, they're putting the blame on parents and women that are going through difficult times because of sexual harassment instead of sexual predators. Well, the Girl Scouts are essentially saying that young girls being hugged by family members sets the stage for being sexually harassed or worse later in life. It's absurd. Yeah. It's absurd. It, it's not the, the Girl Scouts of America is advising parents not to let male family members hug these little girls. Why? Because it can lead down the road to the little girl wanting to be hugged by people who aren't her family and who might want more than a hug. And if we condition our little girls to be hugged by family members just for greetings and saying hi when you enter a room, it's, it's, this, this is absurd. This is a, trying to affix the blame for a problem where it does not reside and doesn't lie. Another, it, it, another attack on the family, essentially from the Girl Scouts of America of all places. 
which it, obviously has been corrupted now by the left as well. It is, Raj, it is sad to see how the Girl Scouts of America continues to hurt their organization by destroying the basic foundation of our society. They're trying to take away an innocent expression of love from family members. And what is that doing now in present day to all of those women that are suffering? Bingo. Because of sexual predators. Exactly right. And to, to try to relate or compare the hugs, the greetings of male family members to potential future rapists and muggers, I mean, that, that, that is the innocent expression of affection and love in a family can lead to what this is is a sick, sick way of actually ending up blaming the victim when you get right down to it. I don't even know if they see that, but that's essentially what they're doing here, setting up. It is all right. It's going to be okay, folks. Because we're here, the EIB Network. We come back with the real story of Thanksgiving. The real story. A tradition here on the Rush Limbaugh program for the last 25 years. Be right back. Greetings and welcome back. Great to have you. Rush Limbaugh, having more fun than a human being, should be allowed to have its Thanksgiving week. And it kicks off the... In my mind, the Christmas season, which I happen to love, and so we do it. Telephone number, if you want to be on the program, 800-282-2882, and email address, lrushbow at eibnet.us. Here's the thing, let's... Let's, let's review. After the election, what happened? I mean, immediately after the election. I mean, the next day. Do you remember? What do you remember? Exactly right. The, the streets of New York, the streets of Philadelphia, the streets of cities in California were flooded with women wearing hats on their heads that looked like vaginas. They had a name, these hats. And these women, they knitted, they marched, they screamed, they were crying, they were made making fools of themselves in protest of Trump and in fear that Trump would take away their rights. Donald Trump somehow was going to come along and take away everything about their femininity or their masculinity, depending on how they viewed themselves. Well, whatever it was, Trump was going to take it away from them. They were scared, they said. I think the whole thing was bogus. I think it was a George Soros bought and paid for operation. But I don't doubt that some of the women in these protests were genuinely scared to death. That's what liberalism does to people. It scares them. If people have bought it, if if they've absorbed it, if they've been exposed to it for decades... Since childhood, they were scared to death by something other than another liberal being in power. His election was an affront to their delicate snowflake sensibilities. In the meantime, in the meantime, the real people who were and had been limiting and taking away women's rights were not Donald Trump. They were leftist men, leftist men in power, in leftist businesses, were grabbing, were threatening, were harassing, were bullying, were stroking, were tricking, threatening, harassing, firing, limiting job advancement, limiting money to women of all ages. What I want to know is this. Will the women who made fools of themselves wearing vagina hats in masses, in droves after the election, will you now organize and rise up again to protest the real threats to you and your rights and your careers and your jobs? The creeps in Hollywood, the creeps and the preverts in media and in government 
for doing much more than just talking about grabbing something. You might think Trump did all this, but all you've got is Trump talking about it and bragging about it to another guy. That's it. But in the meantime, the guys you claim to respect and love and adore, the real men of the left, in real leftist businesses, were the ones grabbing, not talking, threatening, not talking, harassing, not talking, bullying, tricking, exposing themselves, firing you, and limiting your advancement in jobs and money. You're going to stand up and protest the real threats, ladies, you leftist babes. If if a guy just talking about female anatomy can get you so hysterical, what must all these new revelations do to leftist women? I'm serious. These leftist women who were living in literal quaking fear over Donald Trump, what must they been be thinking now? With Weinstein, with Franken, with Charlie Rose. These are heroes, don't forget. With, let's see, the list goes on, uh, Mark Halperin, Glenn Thrush. And the list is 20 through 25 of them now. With Weinstein, the number's fast approaching 100. And you ladies realize that Judge Moore is not even in the same league. Judge Moore's riding the pine in the minor leagues compared to your guys. No, I'm seriously, what are these leftist women thinking? And you know what I'll bet? I'll bet they're not threatened at all. You think they are? I'd love to be wrong. You think they're mad? Hope you're right. Hope they are. You think they're disillusioned? Do you think they feel betrayed? Do you think they're questioning their own judgment? Do you think they're questioning liberalism? Do you think they're questioning what they've had inculcated into their souls for all these years? Do they think they're feeling betrayed? Yes or no. Huh? So it's just personal. This does not say anything about liberalism to these women. Oh, so they think all men are this way. Trump and these guys, they're no difference. All men are predators, and all men are purse snatchers, and all men are muggists, muggers. Yeah, you may have a point about that. In these particular women's eyes, we're talking about, yeah, you might have a point. But I'll never forget the hysteria. Newsweek magazine, did I not call this... How can we progress on gender roles when women still prefer rich, muscular dudes? This is a reaction to the London subway survey of women and the men they were ogling while nobody knew they were watching. Uh, Nobody knew they were being observed. It's... You remember when Time Magazine did that cover? When they learned that men and women are born different? 1996 or 1997, Time Magazine actually had a cover story, Men and Women Are Born Different, as it was news to them. Now, I love to point this out. Imagine you're the editor at Time Magazine and you come across news that boys and girls are different at birth. That is such shocking news to you that it deserves cover story status. Who in the world thinks that that's news? Well, if you have been steeped in liberalism from the time you're born till the time you get out of J school to the time you start working in journalism, where we had couples raising their little girls with G.I. Joes and deep blue painted bedrooms and uh, and their little boys were in pink bedrooms and playing with Barbie and they were shocked to learn that their little girls were trying to find new wardrobes for G.I. Joe rather than pulling the trigger. I just the leftists are just are are just stunningly stunningly obtuse to me. How can we make progress on gender roles? Why do you want why do you people on the left want to so deny human nature? I have the answer. I just I think it's amazing. I know exactly why. Undeniable truth of life number twenty four. Feminism was created so as to allow unattractive women easier access to the mainstream. Bingo. That thought 
earned me lifetime status as a great thinker. And to this day, women, leftists, feminists, and feminazis are still outraged by undeniable truth of life, number 24. But again, this is just half the story. I just have to remind you, this story is women ogling men on the subway, and these leftists are all upset that these women are eyeing rich, attractive, muscular guys who wear suits, by the way. Can you imagine a reaction when they found, if they find out what women, or men, rather, are looking at on the subway? Imagine the shock and the anger that's going to accompany that realization. <laughs> okay, audio soundbite time. Grab soundbites number 21 and 22. What we have here, CBS News, 60 Minutes. September 10th of this year, Charlie Rose interviewing former White House Chief Strategist Steve Bannon during a discussion about the impact of the Access Hollywood tape on then-Republican nominee Trump's campaign, here is soundbite number one. Okay, let me bring you to Billy Bush. Take us inside the dilemma that he faced. Look, this was locker room talk. This was two guys on a bus or a dressing room years and years and years ago. Uh, this is not the guy that, that people know, and people know Donald Trump. So we dismissed that at hand of any of this over the top. And we thought the reaction would be so over the top from the mainstream media and from the left. The American people don't care about how you talk about they, women that way. They, they don't care about locker room talk. They, but they do care about values, and they do care about respect for women. They, they do. do. They, they do, do but, know they, that. but they but and it's not just locker room talk. That's I mean, locker room talk. The Billy Bush thing is locker room talk. So here's Rose. He's getting on Bannon's case about Trump and the Access Hollywood video. He's trying to make a big deal out of what Trump said. And all the while, Charlie Rose knows what he's been doing. And here he is trying to castigate Bannon by association and getting Bannon to castigate Trump. But that wasn't it. There was a little bit more. Are, Are you kidding? trying to destroy someone when you simply describe what they have said? They're not describing what he said. If, if you, you look describe at what, said, what it was much if more. If you run the tape, which is a news item, that's no, not no, trying to no, destroy no, somebody. No, 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 that's no, simply Charlie, trying Charlie, to report. Charlie, give me a break. The famous debate where we brought the women. The Clinton accusers. That was your deal? A hundred percent. You wanted to do that for a while? A hundred percent. Why? Because I thought if you're going to go after Donald Trump for his words, let's have the Clintons defend Clinton's actions. You remember that Clinton invited the abused women of Bill Clinton to have a front row seat at one of the, uh, one of the debates. But here's Charlie Rose badgering Steve Bannon over the Trump Access Hollywood video. Uh... And especially over what Trump said. You you can't just say it's nothing because he only did was said it. All he did was say it. That, that, you can't let him get away with that. And Bannon said, is this locker room talk, Charlie? It's all it was. If Bannon had known then what he knows today, can you imagine how that interview might have gone? <laughs> mm -hmm. well, yeah, everybody knew it. Again, with Charlie Rose, everybody knew it, including the exec producer of his pro, which was a woman, and that's to whom the women employees complained. And she said, that's just Charlie. you just got to accept that's just Charlie. It's just Charlie. It's, it's harmless. It's Charlie. And now she's, of course, saying, I wish I'd have done so much more. I wish I would have taken it much more seriously. I didn't realize. I wish it would. Her job depended on staying in Rose's good graces as well. Back to the CBS uh, show this morning. More Nora O'Donnell and Gail King as they deal with the reality that the guy sharing a chair on their set is a sexual abuser and pervert. This is a moment that demands a frank and honest assessment about where we stand and more generally the safety of women. Let me be very clear. There is no excuse for this alleged behavior. It is systematic and pervasive. And I've been doing a lot of listening and I'm going to continue to do that. This I know is true. Women cannot achieve equality in the workplace or in society until there is a reckoning and a taking of responsibility. This will be investigated. This has to end. This behavior is wrong. Period. So they're throwing Charlie Rose overboard on the CBS uh, This Morning show today with Nora O'Donnell making it clear 
that this is unacceptable, will not be tolerated. She's sending the message. There's no way this guy's coming back here. I don't care what happens. I don't care where he goes to rehab. I don't care how many apologies. I don't care how many admissions. He's not coming back here. She is making it abundantly clear that she didn't know. Right? Up next is Gail King. This is the BFF of the Oprah. And she was especially pained at the revelations. I got an hour and 42 minutes of sleep last night. Both my son and my daughter called me. Oprah called me and said, are you okay? I am not okay. After reading that article in the Post, it was deeply disturbing, troubling, and painful for me to read. That said, I think we have to make this matter to women, the women that have spoken up, the women who have not spoken up because they're afraid. I'm hoping that now they will take the step to speak out, too, that this becomes a moment of truth. To be very honest with you, I'm still trying to process all of this. I'm still trying to sort it out because this is not the man I know, but I'm also clearly on the side of the women who have been very hurt and very damaged by this. You know, if if they didn't know, this had to be shocking. I mean, this... And I think they're telling the truth, too. I don't, I don't think they knew. I think they were blindsided by this. And I, I'll tell you, folks, I totally understand both of these women, Nora O'Donnell and Gail King. I can understand Gail King being so upset she only got an hour and a half sleep. I can totally understand it. You have to realize that all of these people are in the same club and they look there are rivalries and jealousies but it's them against us and they're unified in that regard and they hold each other in the highest of esteem ideologically being on that same team the left wing the liberalism same team and they have this surface there is no question this totally shocked them and undid them this is not the kind of thing that they think goes on in their immediate circle. And I think, I think it was very brave of these women to tackle this today as openly and as upfront and as courageously as they did. I just, they had all, they had all kinds of choices. They could have ignored it. They, yes, they could have. Doesn't matter. You get somebody else to sit in the chair. They could have ignored it. The suits at CBS could have said, "We're not making this any worse. We're just not going to. We're going to acknowledge Charlie Rose being." That would have been the old-fashioned way of dealing with this. He's not here. You don't address it. Every day we look forward. We don't talk about what happened last night. Our own people. Our own people. Are, there are any number of ways to have ignored this, but they tackled it head on. And not only that, they made it abundantly clear he's not coming back. He is not welcome back. Um, anyway, I take a break here. My friends are up against it once again on the programming clock, the format clock. But we will be right back. Don't go away. By the way, one thing that's not been mentioned in the Washington Post story, I haven't read them all, but Charlie Rose had a live-in girlfriend. Her name was Amanda Burden, and she is the granddaughter of William Paley, the founder of CBS. And she has... She has uh, standard oil money in her family. She has uh, railroad money in her family. She is a very wealthy uh, doy, and I've met her. I, I've met she and Charlie at, uh, at social soirees back when I didn't know what I was doing by showing up to them. And uh, she's she's always been his girlfriend. She's always been there, never married. She's 73. Now Charlie is 75. And you have to wonder, I mean, all this stuff's going on. Does she know about it or not know about it? Now the Washington Post story is out there. If she knew about it, that I guarantee you in her circle, this is doubly embarrassing. Amanda, Amanda, did you know? This is not a, not a, not a pretty picture out there. This establishment stuff, folks, I'll tell you, they, they, they're so protected, so insulated that, um, they're seldom held to account on anything, and then something like this happens. It's about rocking your world. Talent on loan from God. In all four corners of the world, I, El Rushbo, am a household name. 
And we head back to the phones now. This is uh, J.R., Columbus, Ohio. Great that you waited. I appreciate your patience. Hi. Mega Thanksgiving dittos, Rush. Thank you, sir. Absolutely. Uh, okay, so do you think it's strange that Barack and Michelle Obama have been very quiet since the Harvey Weinstein thing blew up? No, because I I would not expect them to join the chorus of condemnation. Mm. Uh, I they, they might utter a statement or something, a sentence, but then they're not they're not going to dwell on this. Um, I no. Does it surprise you? What will you expect them to say? It it surprises. Well, maybe it doesn't surprise me. These are the people they hang out with. Isn't that correct? Oh, exactly. They they hang around with them. They take their money. They join them at other fundraisers. They pat each other's back on joint charities. Absolutely. They were inseparable political buddies. Right. Got it. Yep, yep. Well, with friends like that, who needs enemies, right? Well, that's... (laughs) You know, that's the thing about this. Uh... These are questions I don't know. Let me just share. When when I see the Weinstein, not the Weinstein, when I see Harvey palling around with Bill and Hillary Clinton, and knowing the Clintons as I do, I wonder if what evolves there is a genuine friendship or a politically expedient photo op kind of relationship. Now, no question the Clintons thrive on the money that Weinstein brings. But is it the money that opens the Clintons' doors for the Weinsteins, or is it that the Clintons really like the guy and would be in their circle of friends if there wasn't any money? And that's where I think, no. I think in too many worlds of politics, money is the fundamental ingredient in relationships. I guess one of the many things wrong with it. Uh... And this has been an eye-opening thing for me, too. I have had, you know, folks, I have been so naive about many things, uh, like most of us are for, for most of my life. I mean, I, for example, when I'm younger and I'm reading any publication, a newspaper, magazine, and I see a profile of a person, not necessarily a Hollywood star, just a person, somebody noteworthy for doing something. In the old days, I used to think that that profile was there because whoever was being profiled had genuinely earned it by being singularly unique or having a distinct achievement that warranted such attention in the media. Later on, much later on, I learned that that's got nothing to do with who gets profiled. It has to do with PR agents pitching these stories to reporters and editors, and it, 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 it comes about, in, in most cases, largely for reasons unrelated to the substance. And it is in these circumstances that you learn how media relationships created are created. And it's, it's not based on <clears throat> the uh, same things that you would think friendships are based on, that are genuine and real. I mean, you really like somebody, not that they're going to raise a bunch of money for you or give you a bunch of money. You really like somebody not because they're going to arrange a big magazine story on you, but you genuinely like them. And I think in the world of politics, money is the element that puts people together. Now, I've always known that to be the case, but now I ask myself, if it weren't for the fact that Weinstein's out raising a bunch of money and giving it to the Clintons, would they spend any time with him at all? I don't know the answer to that, but if the answer is no, then what does it say about the relationship to begin with? That it's kind of fragile and it's based on things that have nothing to do with genuine, real friendships and relationships. I mean, how do the Obamas know Weinstein? I mean, the Clintons were first with Weinstein going way back to the 90s. Here comes Obama. Obama knows Weinstein because they're both Democrats. Weinstein likes to hang around with powerful people, so much so that he will raise and spend money to do it. And let me give you a little hint. That's how you have to do it. If you want to hang around with a president, raise a lot of money. If you want to be invited to presidential forums and reach, raise a lot of money for them or donate. I guarantee you'll be invited. 
whether the president knows you or not. And then you'll be able to go through the motions of being a friend of the president, be able to talk to your friend. Yeah, the president and I were talking the other day. What made it possible was you giving the money, not the fact the president knows who you are, really likes you. That could end up happening. So as far as the Obamas are concerned, I think it's quite natural they'd look at this thing and think Harvey's probably worth throwing overboard here. Harvey doesn't mean enough to them to try to save him. That's up to Harvey. If Harvey can save himself, if Harvey can rehab himself, if Harvey can get back to where he was and start resuming funneling money, then the Obamas will welcome him back. It's another reason why I couldn't I could never do politics. I just I I I couldn't ask for donations and then I wouldn't want to be obligated after I got any. I just couldn't do it. A different world. Uh, but money is what creates many political relationships. Donating it, arranging for it, bundling it. Uh, and once you're out of that business, your contact with the politician in question diminishes. Their time is very limited. And most politicians, from presidents to senators to members of the House, you wouldn't believe how much of their spare time is spent raising money for the next election. In the Senate, that's practically all they do. And if you don't have a connection to them with money, the odds are you're not going to be in the inner circle or anywhere near them. Do you hear what Sarah Huckabee Sanders pulled off yesterday? What am I thankful for? Yeah, this is great. This is absolutely great. Sarah Huckabee Sanders at the White House press briefing made every reporter stop and explain what they were thankful for. And there's a website out there called Splinter News, a bunch of leftists that were just outraged over this. They were they were spitting mad over it. The headline, White House reporters embarrassed themselves telling Sarah Huckabee Sanders what they're thankful for. During today's White House press briefing, Sarah Huckabee Sanders told reporters that if they wanted to ask a question, they had to first say something they were thankful for. And the press corps went along with it. And the people here at Splinter are livid. Sanders immediately called upon April Ryan, who as a black woman has been a continual target of White House press secretaries. She's not been a target. Hey, Splinter, April Ryan is not a target. They kiss her butt. Every press secretary since she's been in the press room kisses her rear end. You know, she's the new Helen Thomas in a way they don't want to make her mad. What do you mean, target? To her credit, Ryan quickly responded with an appropriate level of snark, stating, I'm thankful to be able to talk to you and question you every single day. For the rest of the briefing, other reporters then prefaced their questions with things they were grateful for, their families, the First Amendment, their colleagues, their wives, and even, I'm thankful th for this exercise, one reporter said. When Zeke Miller of the Associated Press did not give a thanks, Sanders stopped him. You broke the rule. You haven't offered anything you're thankful for. Sanders wrapped up the briefing by saying thank you for participating in this very fun exercise. Now, the people at Splinter News say this was an intensely embarrassing exercise. No one should have played along with Sanders' request. This is not a school. Reporters are not children. And they don't have to acquiesce to displays of gratitude just because the White House press secretary asked them to. The knee-jerk obedience was especially humiliating, given the way the press has been treated by the Trump administration. Something as harmless and as innocent as this? The press are not children as news to me, too. That's exactly what they are. You know, I remember, you remember old buddy Tony Snow, Mr. Snurdly? Tony Tony Snow was once a guest host of this program. He uh, uh, became, uh, well, he, he was the, the Brett Bayer of Fox News for a while. And then he became White House press secretary for George W. Bush. And I'll never forget one press briefing. They were just all over him about immigration. 
You know, Tony Snow did not believe in amnesty, but he had to speak up for it because it was the Bush administration policy. So he became the dutiful soldier trying to extol the virtues of amnesty and illegal immigration. Um, uh, well, well, not illegal, but, but uh, illegal immigrants being normalized. And some of the conservative press corps just hammered him. I mean, they just, just went after him to the nail on hypocrisy and phoniness. And he stopped him one day and said, you know, have you people ever stopped to realize where we are every day? You ever stop to realize how special the opportunity we all have is? In other words, Tony Snow was in awe of being the White House press secretary, of working for a president, of having the job of press secretary, and it was something that always remained special to him. It never became humdrum or routine or taken for granted. And I think that's what Sarah Huckabee Sanders was doing. Name something you're thankful for. Hey, can we... Can we act like human beings today instead of programmed robots? And it doesn't surprise me at all that some splinter press bunch would be all upset that the reporters didn't tell her to go take a hike. Melissa Gilbert has the, is the second woman to accuse Oliver Stone of sexual harassment. That's a name I was trying to remember early on. And the Florida Democratic Party chairman has resigned over allegations of sexual harassment. Stephen Bittell, or Biddle, I don't know how he pronounces it, tendered his resignation Friday after a report alleging that he sexually harassed women and created a hostile work environment. A brief time out. We'll be back and continue in a jiffy. Well, you're going to be over the river and through the woods on the way to Grandma or Grandpa's house tomorrow. And we're going to be right here. And we will uh, we'll do Open Line Friday on Wednesday tomorrow since uh, we have Thursday and Friday off. Most everybody else does Thanksgiving holiday. So look forward to being with you tomorrow, folks. We always do, and tomorrow's no different. Thank you for being with us today, too. Cheerio.